Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Schmidt, and welcome to the Mini Medical School. So tonight's edition of the Mini Med, Med School is entitled, Why Are People Acting So Weird? Social Disruption in Substance Use During the Pandemic. I think most of us have uh, been watching with quite a bit of um, concern um, a, about what's going on in America and, and, um, and one of the kind of new developments during the pandemic has been up, upset during school board meetings. Uh, these are, are parents of children, kind of upstanding citizens and, and what's going on that there's so much disruption and um, angst going on around what would normally be in America kind of uh, business as usual, it's just the school board. Um, we were also seeing whole new types of crime, these smash and grab uh, looting incidents that have occurred around the country. Um, again, a whole new level of, of um, upset going on in, in the country in new forms of, of um, disruption. Uh, we're also seeing this massive increase in unruly passenger um, situations on airplanes where they literally have to subdue people sometimes after drinking too much, but not always. Um, they have to subdue people by duct taping folks to their chairs to um, just contain them, themselves, them. And so the, the question really um, comes about why are people acting so weird? What is going on? Why all of a sudden, um, since 2020, are we seeing these new forms of, of public unrest and, and just skyrocketing rates of, of um, social disruption? And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. What might be the explanations for what is going on in America and what might be the solutions. And a lot of tonight is gonna to focus on what's going on in California in particular and around solving or at least buffering um, our population from these challenging situations. So I'm a sociologist and uh, I go right back to the work of foundational work in the 19th century by Emile Durkheim to try to understand uh, the situation going on in America during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Durkheim had this very interesting concept called anomi. And essentially it's a concept that um, explains what happens when societies experience, experience a breakdown in more traditional forms of social regulation, social integration. And um, the idea behind anomi comes back to this image of a blood centrifuge. And so if you're thinking about blood in the human body, it's a lot of little cells, right? And what the centrifuge does is it spin, spins that blood so fast that the cells in the blood hit the walls of the test tube and fall apart. And so if you take that analogy and you apply it to societies, it's a really good way of understanding what Durkheim meant by anomi. Each of us as human beings, we're, we're, we're in the bloodstream of our society and we are individual cells. And normally we flow through that bloodstream together in really um, pretty standard and fluid ways. When anomi hits, it's like the centrifuge. It throws us each as individuals against the walls of the test tube and breaks us apart. And in that process, it deregulates us. There's a lot that goes on. We may not even notice it because it's so taken for granted that keeps people together. And when anomi hits, it pushes us apart and disrupt the kind of standard social regulation um, strategies that we all tend to live by. Now, what are those social regulation strategies? They range from everything from a simple, what we call informal social controls. So a very um, simple look of disdain when somebody's doing something that isn't quite right. We all know what that feels like when our mothers used to just give us the look 
and we'd stop our bad behavior, right? So there's informal social controls, and then there's all the way to the other extreme, uh, macro sociological formal social controls. So institutionalized forms of social control for people who may have a career of um, uh, not, a, not behaving according to kind of standard social rules who wind up being um, uh, institutionalized in one form or another. And so in, in, a, in a typical society, you're gonna have this full range of ways that people help each other to socially regulate. And where it might've been that you were taking a plane pre-pandemic and somebody may, may, a passenger in the seat next to you or across the aisle might have been drinking too much. A lot of people would just simply look over to that person and kind of go, oof, don't do that. Informal social controls would be enough to kind of check that behavior. But it, at it, it, post pandemic, what we're seeing is that there's so much upwelling of um, lack of individual regulation that often those controls are not enough to stop um, behaviors that are antisocial and people wind up having to actually use formal forms of, of social control. So getting authority figures to come in and try to correct antisocial behavior. And you know, people, especially in America, don't always like the idea of in, uh, control or formal informal control because uh, we're all rugged individualists. But in fact, these kinds of social regulations give us all a break. Uh, we don't have to regulate ourselves so much because we can rely on other people to kind of keep correcting the ship. And um, when and and when these social regulations fray we tend to have all manner of disruption um, happening. And so if you think, of, go back to the simple look, that woman, uh, the model in the prior slide, it's a look of disdain is uh, what she's doing there. And if you think about that, often that's enough from an important person in, in an individual's life to actually stop um, unruly behavior. Um, but in the context of a pandemic, we're all, all of the cells in the blood have been kind of pushed apart. And so that face-to-face -face encounters that would kind of provide lots of opportunities for informal social controls are, are not happening as much. Even the fact that people have to wear masks to be safe might mean that there's less ability to read other people's faces and think about, hey, am I kind of acting out a little bit too much here? There's also during the pandemic, less police activity um, during lockdowns in particular. And so even formal social regulations have sort of been frayed and, and, um, and limited. And so this adds to the problems around sort of standard ways that the society can regulate itself. Uh, then you add on top of that the fact that we are now normally, I've done mini med school before, and normally I'm in a room and I'm seeing you all in person and I can see your faces and I can react to your reactions. And there's a lot of back and forth that goes on in those face-to-face -face encounters. In the Zoom workplace, um, we're really in a different kind of environment where those face-to-face -face interactions I'm like looking at my boss over the Zoom machine and I may not be able to read their, their reactions very carefully. And I don't have this constant day-to-day -day reinforcement that there's a hierarchy here. And if I misbehave, I might lose my job, right? And so in a typical workplace, you're gonna have the boss in the big office in the corner, you're gonna walk in, there's gonna be a sense of, we're in, a, we're in a social hierarchy and we're regulating one another. And while again, we as Americans, we may not like to think about hierarchy as like a desirable thing. We prefer a democratic kind of vision of society. Social hierarchy all, does have its advantages in that it helps individuals sort of think about themselves in relation to others within um, the society. And 
um, to inculcate a sense of respect for authority um, that can actually help uh, individuals regulate themselves because they know if they don't regulate themselves, they're going to get regulated by the society and by authority figures. Now, when Durkheim thought about Anomi, he really was very specifically focused on economic turbulence, uh, changes in the economic system that drives the society. And his, his theory was that when economic turbulence comes along, again, there's a social hierarchy, there's a bit of a pecking order in the society, the haves and the have nots, if you will. And so what happens during periods of economic unrest is that individuals get kind of displaced from their normal position um, within the societal hierarchy. And as a result, they, again, they become that cell that is sort of against the wall of the test tube, freed from the rest of the collective. And that this can cause individual, um, uh, individuals kind of being flung away from the collective and thinking a little less carefully about how their behavior will influence others in the collective. And um, so these are some screenshots from the New York Times. They have a wonderful database um, talking about what's going on in our economy during the pandemic. And as you can see, right around when um, January 2020 happens, we're seeing this plunging um, uh, of wage, uh, monthly wages and, and salaries. It recovers what's really cool and very, um, I think we can thank our policymakers a lot for this, there's quite a bit of economic recovery by October of 2021 or October of um, 2020, but there is a real um, uh, downturn in, in, in wages and salaries. And then looking at, um, at, at rents, so if you have this kind of change in, in real income, uh, you think, okay, well, at least there's a good, this great economic recovery. But in fact, the cost of living as we are all experiencing with inflation has gone up and it really did start going up in 2020. Um, and, and this is the home price index is an, is an example of that. And so you're seeing this rising cost of living relative to wages and salaries. We're also seeing labor force participation. So the ultimate displacement of individuals from the societal pecking order or the hierarchy is job loss, uh, which is a massive assault on an individual's um, ability to survive. And here we see a tremendous drop off in, in um, employment following the pandemic. So economic turbulence certainly is a factor that could be driving ANOMI during this pandemic. I want, to sh I want to turn very briefly to some of the health consequences. We know that from the research on social determinants of health, that economic well-being is very deeply tied to health in all manner of, of um, ways. And so one would posit that during these dramatic um, economic turbulence and social disruption um, associated with the pandemic, we'd be seeing quite a bit of um, changes in health outcomes. And that is indeed, and unfortunately, what we are seeing um, today. And a lot of today, tonight we'll be talking about what, what we can do as a society to buffer people from these um, hardships. So this is a simple, um, table that shows leading causes of death in America, um, 2015 through all the way through 2020. And so we're really interested in what happened right uh, the year before and the, and the year of, uh, first year of the pandemic. And um, the first thing that you can see is suicides. Now Durkheim's um, empirical research on anomi was really about suicide because his argument was that when the individual feels disengagement from the collective, the ultimate act of expression of that disengagement is killing oneself, literally um, taking oneself out of the collective. And so we often during periods of disruption see elevated rates of suicide and that's exactly what we're seeing um, um, it, between the year before and the first year of the pandemic. 
uh, but even more uh, relevant, and we're going to hear a little bit more about this tonight, are the rates of, this is unintentional injuries. And a lot, this is a really big jump in one year. And a lot of this is driven by opioid overdoses causing death. And so we're already seeing within the first year of the pandemic, pretty dramatic changes in key indicators of ANOME, um, suicide and uh, death due to drug overdose. Here's a little more information as we all are thinking about acutely uh, this week, uh, tragic incidents of, of um, open shooting uh, in, in two locations in the last 10 days in America, um, we're seeing these dramatic increases already in 2020 in um, fire, firearm homicides. Uh, we're also seeing an uptick here in firearm suicides. And um, these rates are tragically, um, they're tragically high um, disparities in who's being affected by homicides and suicides having to do with gun violence. Uh, we're also seeing um, a pretty dramatic change in alcohol consumption and alcohol-related deaths. And this is a paper that just appeared in JAMA recently. Look at this, right within just the first few months of the between announcing that we've got a public health emergency and locking down, you already see this dramatic uptick in alcohol-related deaths and it just keeps going up. Here's um, a very tragic slide showing the dramatic uptick in um, drug-involved in, in overdoses, um, many of these due to opioids. And um, remarkably, you think, well, um, cigarettes, e-cigarettes are not intoxicating, <laughs> they, right? You'd hope to see that uh, consumption is not being affected. And the really interesting thing, this is a data from a survey where um, smokers were asked what, what happened during the pandemic. And universally, smokers, as the pandemic started, were, were concerned about smoking because they knew that it could increase their risk of severe COVID outcomes if they did um, develop COVID-19. And so many, many smokers wanted and tried to quit. And what we're seeing here is that many of those efforts uh, to quit were not actually, um, uh, uh, did not actually manifest in, in successful quitting rates for both, in, in the, the, there were differences between e-cigarettes and combustible cigarettes, but that a lot of the people who went into the um, pandemic hoping that they could use it as an opportunity to quit were not successful. And a lot of these folks who were unable to quit um, talked about stress as part of the reason. So tonight, we're really focused on solutions and particularly thinking about solutions in California and in the United States. And um, that's where public health policy comes in. Uh, public health, and we're, ta we're not talking about public health restrictions on COVID-19, we're talking about public health as a strategy for buffering people from these harsh outcomes related to suicide, gun violence, addictive substances. And, um, and these are really um, effective and, and well-researched societal strategies for managing health risks. And the bottom line is that they are formal control strategies. Uh, as I mentioned, they are strategies that um, because they're policies, they get built into the social environment and ideally they're invisible to us on a day-to-day -day basis. We just take them for granted. You pop it yourself in the car, you just body memory, you put a seatbelt on, right? I remember when I was in grad school, there were huge fights over airbags in, 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 um, in cars. We just assume, oh, right, you know, I got that airbag just in case. And so the best of our public health strategies are not heavy lifting. They're just things that we build into the environment in order to help people be safe. And they really come down to, especially when we are talking about um, harmful substances and products that, um, that can kill people, 
uh, we're really talking about sort of two ways that public health strategies work. The first is to reduce the chances that people even engage in risky behaviors. So we try to do things like make um, uh, laws that make guns less available to the general public, or if they are available, they're less harmful kinds of guns. They're not assault weapons. They're um, guns that can kill fewer people if they get used. We think about putting an age limit on um, uh, gun purchases or um, alcohol or tobacco purchases so that they're a little harder for vulnerable groups of children and people who could get really harmed um, through their use. A little harder for them to, to obtain the substances and particularly when substances are addictive to even walk down the path of becoming, becoming dependent. The other way that we, we try to do um, public health um, policies in this area is around reducing the harm if people are gonna take, um, take risks. And this goes under the umbrella of harm reduction. And so these are simple things like promoting safer choices through needle exchange, interventions, um, server interventions, or when bartenders and cocktail um, waiters and waitresses are just trained in how to recognize the science that somebody's intoxicated and what to do about it, how to get people into safe um, ways to get home, um, and then also safeguarding people from the worst outcomes. So if people do use, um, and they use in an addictive way, how do we um, arm them with say a, a, a drug, miracle drug, uh, naloxone, that essentially can stop a person from dying from an overdose from opioids. Uh, these are agonist medications that just, it's like taking a, a little nasal, um, um, a puff on a, a nasal inhaler, and it sends a, a drug into the body to protect the individual from an overdose or agonist med medication. So people who've suffered with addictions can stop, um, can just take a medication that makes it a little harder to get really high and, and, and helps them um, work, work, work with being in, in an addictive situation. And so um, finally, um, I, I wanna introduce the folks on the panel who really are all about solutions to these problems and they have some really interesting uh, things to say about what we can all do and what kinds of public health policies we can support to buffer people during this period of, of pandemic and anomie, social disruption from the worst um, health harms uh, here that, that it brings. And uh, our first speaker is going to be Dr. Dori Apollonio. She's a um, professor in the School of Pharmacy at UCSF and an expert on um, uh, cigarette and, and tobacco consumption, as well as cannabis and other substances of abuse. And Dory is gonna be speaking to us tonight about e-cigarettes in particular, uh, and their, uh, the importance of that issue for um, young people. Uh, Matt Tierney is here with us tonight um, from the School of Medicine. He's a clinical professor and an expert in medicated, uh, medication assisted treatment for opioid disorders. And he's been a real leader in trying to expand um, our very limited behavioral health workforce to include people who are equipped to provide people who struggle with addiction uh, with medications that can actually protect them from the worst harms um, that that problem can bring about. And then finally, Dr. Jim Kahn, he's here from the School of Medicine. Jim is a, um, is a physician and also an expert in cost-effectiveness analysis. And he's gonna be here tonight talking about some really innovative work that he's done to uh, work with the Surgeon General of California to think about some of these some of the ways that we can use um, public health policy to protect and buffer populations throughout California from some of the secondary effects of the pandemic, substance abuse and other um, related behavioral health issues. So with that, um, I will turn it over to our first speaker who is Dr. Apollonio. Thanks, Laura. All right, so Laura asked me to talk about vaping and youth. Um, and so I'd like to start with this slide that shows the pictures of different 
generations of e-cigarettes um, because people don't always realize how much they've changed since they first hit the market around 2008 in the US. Um, so originally e-cigarettes looked a lot like cigarettes um, and then they sort of turned into these devices that like had a mouthpiece like cigarettes, but were st it was still the general shape. Um, and then increasingly as time goes on, they sort of turned into their own products, which may not look like cigarettes at all. Um, they look like, you know, flash drives or a little, um, you know, necklace pendants and things like that. Yeah, so it's really a new market. So I'm going to talk about as a roadmap why we should care about vaping, um, because originally that wasn't clear at all. Um, the extent of regulation of these types of products and emerging issues that have come up when we've studied vaping. Um, so first of all, why should we care about vaping? Um, E-cigarettes were first presented to the US market um, as a way to stop smoking, smoking cessation. Um, the promise of vaping was that you could quit smoking cigarettes um, and, you, and transition to a lower harm product. Uh, and this sort of comes down to this issue of, you know, that when you talk about a, a problematic behavior like smoking, um, you, you care about sort of at least three groups. The first group you care about is the people who are currently smoking. The second group you care about are the people who are at risk of smoking, which in the US is mostly youth. And the third people you care about are people who formerly smoked who might return. Um, and so vaping was presented as a solution to people who currently smoke, but what got forgot about, forgotten about initially and has become a huge problem is youth who were not gonna smoke, um, but who were vulnerable to e-cigarette use. Um, so as a result of the shift to vaping in the US market, it, we've reached a point where nearly a quarter of high schoolers in the US use tobacco products. And the majority of those use not just e-cigarettes, but flavored e-cigarettes. Um, and like increasingly they look not like what you recognize as cigarettes. This YOLO tropical fruit disposable vape is a flavored vaping device um, that people wear on their neck like a lanyard. And specifically during the pandemic, um, purchases of e-cigarettes and other vaping devices shifted online. It was COVID related because they weren't going out of their houses as much. Um, and it's reached the point where online marketing is the tobacco industry is primarily primary form of advertising and the tobacco industry has really taken over the vaping industry um, over a quarter of purchases made online are not age verified so they're very attractive to minors um, so it, in, to the extent that there is age verification it usually comes as a click through where you like see on the site where you might purchase cigarette e-cigarettes online where it says like i verified that i'm over the age of 18. Um, and when the time comes to purchase kind of the best case scenario is they ask you to upload a photo of a face and upload a photo of an ID and they check to see that they match, but there's nothing saying that like it has to be your face or your ID that you upload photos of. Um, and as a result of that, over three quarters of purchase attempts um, online by minors are successful. Um, they, they, you know, it's, it's not a high barrier. And so although the FDA has sought to prevent underage sales, um, especially online, um, when they do write, write a warning letter to uh, retailers who've been found of violations of age verifications or selling illegal products. Um, four years ago, um, maybe 80% of those violations were fixed and 20% were people who or retailers who continued to sell those products. More recently, the rate of retailers who just ignore FDA warnings and continue to sell products has gone up even higher. Um, so here's an example of how sort of retailers who are selling e-cigarettes move around um, regulations as they happen. Um, so the when the FDA first started taking steps against vaping, recognizing the risks that they were posing to children, um, a lot of manufacturers switched to synthetic nicotine, which wasn't like legally regulated um, because they just didn't think to put it in the regulation. It was called by the New York Times, the loophole that's return, fueling a return to teenage vaping. So you see this process by which um, the U U.S. government tries to sort of catch up um, as, as uh, products innovate. Um, so on April of 2022, just last month, um, the Congress gave the FDA the authority to regulate synthetic nicotine in fruit flavors. Um, they have the authority, but they haven't done it yet. So in the time that it takes them to promulgate regulations is probably, if, if history is any guide, another two or three years before anything actually happens. Um, we should care about e-cigarette use because it harms health. 
Um, in general, users, people who put, take, you know, use e-cigarettes, view them as being completely different from re com regular combustible cigarettes. They have to perceive them as being healthier, um, and a lot of people perceive that they can use them for smoking cessation. There are a lot of people who perceive that they're using them for cessation who ultimately end up using both e-cigarettes and combustible cigarettes. Um, there is no health benefit from dual use of combustible cigarettes and e-cigarettes. Um, for current smokers, you would only see a potential health benefit if you made the transition completely, but that turns out to be quite rare. Um, and it's still unclear, even if you do make the transition completely, how much or whether you get a health benefit, um, despite a lot of advertising suggesting that you do. And unfortunately, e-cigarette use among youth um, leads to combustible cigarette use. Uh, and, you know, especially if you know anything about teenagers, you know, that they tend to lose things and drop things. Um, once you become addicted to nicotine, if you don't have an e-cigarette handy, um, there's a large bumming culture that allows you to have access to traditional combustible cigarettes if you want a nicotine fix. Um, and so as a result, even people who start with e-cigarettes will eventually, um, in most cases, transition to combustible cigarette use. Um, and furthermore, smoking and vaping can increase the risk of contracting COVID-19, despite some early studies um, that suggested that smoking might decrease the risk of COVID-19. Um, they later identified that those studies were conducted poorly, um, and in fact, the, just the opposite effect was there. So. Um, I've talked a little bit about regulation and sort of products getting ahead of the FDA. Um, so that's always the question people have, aren't these products regulated? Well, as I mentioned, research and regulation has lagged behind product innovation. Um, what we know about e-cigarettes is actually kind of old because most of the studies that have been done about e-cigarettes were completed before 2016. Um, there's been huge shifts in the market since then. Um, so in 20, before 2016, up to 2016, advertising claims from e-cigarettes were related to claims about health, um, that if you quit using combustible cigarettes and switch to e-cigarettes, you'd be healthier. And you quit smoking, it was a cessation claim that it was better for, you know, than other products at helping you to quit smoking. Um, and also you saw a lot of advertising claiming that e-cigarettes were a great way to get around clean indoor air laws. They kept you from smoking cigarettes indoors, but if you use an e-cigarette um, that you could, you could smoke inside again, um, which was actually a, a claim that was really appealing to former smokers um, in combination with the health claims. Um, since then, state and local laws have moved to make indoor e-cigarette use regulated the same way as indoor tobacco, combustible tobacco product use, but at the time it was not, for 2016, that was not the case. So in 2016, a lot of things changed. The FDA finally made some deeming regulations and it made some of these advertising claims illegal. So there were things you couldn't do anymore that you used to be able to do. Um, and in 2021, we saw a bunch more um, regulatory changes uh, reflecting the concern about e-cigarette use, um, particularly among youth. Um, the first one was the PMTA, the Pre-Market Tobacco Product Application Acceptances. So before 2021, if you wanted to sell an e-cigarette or vape juice or something like that, all you had to do was sort of open up a shop. Um, in 2021, the FDA said, if you want to sell these products, you have to tell us that you're planning to sell these products and submit an application so that we can review it later. Um, also in 2021, um, there was an update to the PACT Act, the Prevent All Cigarette Trafficking Act. Um, and the first thing that it did is it made it illegal for the US Postal Service to ship vaping products. So before that, if you opened up an online store, you could sell your vaping products anywhere in the country through USPS. Now that's illegal. PACT Act also discourages common carriers like UPS and FedEx from doing the same thing. And this is regulated by the BAT BATF, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, unlike other um, tobacco, unlike other e-cigarette regulations. Um, and so mostly UPS and FedEx do not ship these products anymore. And in 2022, as I mentioned, the FDA was just given the authority to regulate synthetic nicotine. So what do we know about advertising now? Because um, we've just started researching that. Current advertising claims for e-cigarettes still emphasize cessation um, and stealth use, although they don't claim it's legal anymore. Um, but they also spend a lot of time emphasizing flavors, cartoons, and regulatory approval. Um, so this is an example of a really popular e-cigarette vape juice. It's called the Candy King e-liquid. And as you can see, it's got like a little image of strawberries and watermelon, which are the flavors that, they're, um, th that are in this product. 
Um, so Vaping360 says e-cigarettes can be simple and stealthy. They're not claiming that they're illegal. They're just claiming that you can get away with using them indoors when they're illegal. Um, and then we specialize in premium e-liquids, all of which are made from FDA approved food flavorings, kosher grade um, VG and PG and pharmaceutical grade 99.9% .9 pure nicotine. This is an illegal advertising claim, but you'll find it all over online um, claims this to, to, to claim that you have FDA approval for products. Um, similarly, experience pharma grade quality with the best e-cig in the market is the same kind of problem. Retailers suggest that products have regulatory approval. I mentioned that in 2021, the FDA started asking um, e-cigarette manufacturers to put in an application saying that they were applying for the approval to uh, put their products on the market. So as long as they put in the application, whether or not they're actually approved, they can sell them for now. Um, but this has turned into um, a way for retailers to claim that their products have FDA approval. So this taste of summer um, vape product says PMTA accepted. Um, that just means that they have the right to apply for approval, but that they're advertising it like it is the actual approval. Similarly, this pod juice in strawberry kiwi flavor has this big PMTA acceptance check that it suggests that it has regulatory approval. When the FDA does take action against retailers, um, the warnings are often ignored. So we did a study of eight online retailers that received warnings in the first week of September 2021 last year. When you get a warning from the FDA, you get 15 days to remediate the warning and stop selling the product that they've identified. This is one of them, the Vapor Boss Boss Bar Mango flavor um, and, and vape device. So in December 2021, we went back and looked at them but well after 15 days, five of the eight um, People, retailers that received warning letters continued to advertise those specific products for sale, and the remaining three contained content indicating that they continued to sell the products. They didn't list it specifically, but they put out a photo of the product that had been identified, or they listed the product but didn't include a photo. And on those retailers, um, four didn't request any age verification at all, and four used click-through age verification. This Boss Bar Mango product in January 2022 was being sold for half off. Um, I assume to let clear the, the inventory of the product in case the FDA came back and gave them grief about it later. Um, a problem that we see repeatedly in regulating e-cigarettes is that product innovation is faster than regulation. So for example, online retailers will promote different flavors seasonally. Um, and as a result, you know, they sort of in and out before they can be regulated. This is what happened with the boss mango that the FDA um, regulated as you know, gave a warning letter to. They made it a Thanksgiving Day special, I assume because it was orange and mango, um, and put, gave it for half off before the FDA could come back and, and remove their inventory. In addition, new companies try to work around new regulations. I mentioned that under the Prevent All Cigarette Trafficking Act, Online retailers can't use common carriers like USPS um, and UPS to ship vaping products. Um, so there's already been a development of a new delivery system. It's called X Delivery. Um, X Delivery is a courier system that exists solely to move e-cigarette products around the US. Um, and so here's a, on, an online Reddit forum. They talk about how beginning in March 2021, um, you know, we're going to have these new this rollout of a network of an X delivery. And we're urging you to send it to your places of work because it's easier to receive a package. Um, and here's somebody saying that they uh, that good to know it's a viable shipping option. It's a logistics company literally called X. Um, and this person describes what happens when they get a package from X. They order and the juice arrives. Um, and it's a dude in an unmarked car, as they say, who asked me to sign the package and he took a picture of it with his phone. And I imagine you can imagine that this is not a system that, re that lends itself to like, things like age verification to prevent minors from purchasing these products. Um, so Laura asked me to talk about ways to address these problems. The first one um, that's been and probably the one that's been most effective is um, flavor bans. So in July 2017, San Francisco enacted the first comprehensive flavor ban in the US. It included menthol as a flavor and it expanded this ban to new alternative tobacco products like e-cigarettes and that made it unique. Um, and as after that, multiple localities in California and beyond followed suit. There were several lawsuits by the tobacco industry um, and also efforts to overturn the initiative probably based on the, as they knew exactly what would happen in this case. Um, and in April of 2021, um, the US FDA 
announced it supported it, these interventions. So what happened because of the flavor ban? So specifically, it prohibits all San Francisco retail establishments from sale or distribution of any flavored tobacco product and flavored cigarettes, including menthol cigarettes. And as written, it includes even sort of synthetic nicotine products, which are generally under the umbrella of tobacco products. So it's very broadly written. And it took effect in July of 2018, meaning that at that point, the sale of all flavored tobacco products became illegal. And then San Francisco Department of Health went and inspected every retailer in the city, issued citations if they were still selling those products, required that they immediately indicate how they would remediate and modify their practices, and required them to file future reports verifying that they were no longer displaying or selling these products. So a really strong enforcement mechanism. Um, there has been research now on what happened, um, specifically for young adults who are most at risk for use. The time series cross-sectional study of San Francisco residents um, and data were collected using Mechanical Turk, which is an Amazon system where you can be paid to complete little studies. Complete little studies. And they compared December 2018 versus De November of 2019 of ages, people who are aged 18 to 34. Um, and overall, their tobacco product use dec decreased um, because flavors are so appealing. When you get rid of flavors, people stop being interested in using cigarettes. So while combustible cigarette use didn't change, which is what we'd expect because combustible cigarette users are much less attractive to flavors, e-cigarette use declined. And in the long term, because e-cigarette users transition to combustible cigarette use, you'd expect to see a decline in combustible cigarette use, but that's probably in the future. Um, report, respondents reported they were still able to purchase flavored products in some places. Nonetheless, the authors concluded that a comprehensive ban of all flavors, even when done by one individual city, will significantly reduce flavored tobacco product use despite incomplete compliance. Um, so this is an, an innovation that has promise, and it's one that's particularly useful given some of the emerging issues in vaping, which I want to talk about. The first one is co-marketing with other products. So people don't just purchase vapes that have nicotine in them anymore. They often have other products, um, particularly dietary supplements. So some forms of dietary supplements can combine with nicotine solution. Some are used sequentially. Um, one of the more popular ones is kava. Um, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a relax is a relaxing dietary supplement that's supposed to help you relax. So in Vice um, gave an article about what it's like to smoke kava, vape kava kava, and the author wrote it's definitely pleasant, definitely relaxing, and definitely not illegal. When done with the kava wax, I switched out the chambers, dropped in some e-liquid, and took my body to Camp Nicotine, right off Nicotine Valley, USA. Man, legal drugs rock. Um, so this writer indicates it's harmless and not illegal. Um, the NIH has some concerns about this product. Um, it says kava containing products have been associated with liver related injuries, including hepatitis, cirrhosis and liver failure in over 25 reports of adverse events in other countries. In the US, the FDA received a report of a healthy young female who required liver transplantation, as well as several reports of liver related injuries. That's why kava is not legal in other countries, although it still is in the US. In addition, um, vapes will often sell vapes that contain vitamins. This example is vitamin vapes. It says a uh, vitamin vape contains vitamin B12 on top of authoring healthier buzz. The all natural ingredient has numerous health benefits, especially for the nervous system and cell development. Um, the FDA disagrees. In December 2021, it wrote that the use of your B12 vitamin vape product raises safety concerns for the agency because the ingredients or the impurities may trigger laryngospasm or bronchospasm, may be toxic to the tissues in the upper and lower airways, or may be absorbed and exert undesirable systemic effects or organ toxicity. Um, and similarly, you can find vapes with herbal extracts and essential oils and so on. The other product that gets marketed with the vapes now is cannabis and particularly synthetic cannabis. So most online tobacco retailers now are selling synthetic cannabis. Um, one of them, is, they also sell CBD, um, cannabidiol. Um, and so, you know, the, the concern about, there's this expectation that CBD is an, a product that is a cannabis related, but doesn't get you high. Harvard Health Review indicates that while it doesn't get you high, it is in fact psychoactive. Um, and it also, some products contain THC. Um, more noteworthy are true synthetic cannabis like Delta 8, Delta 10, and Delta 11, which are lab-created cannabis uh, cannabidiol products made from hemp, which is legal. It is a 2018 farm bill legalized industrial hemp. 
Um, but these delta derivatives can be sourced from industrial help. Um, and as most of the people who are making these products indicate, the reason that we make these products is because they can be claimed to be legal. The main difference in Delta-8, Delta-9, and Delta-10 THC is federal and state legality. It's not clear that they are in fact legal, but because they're lab-derived and chemically different, retailers can claim that they're legal. There are additional products that are sourced from industrial hemp are like HHC, commercial HHC is made from hemp-derived CBD in a lab. Um, and again, they say it has one major legal advantage over Delta-8 and Delta-9. It isn't called THC, so it doesn't fall under regulations for THC. Um, these products are largely unregulated or poorly regulated, meaning they are allowed sales where um, recreational cannabis is illegal. And synthetic cannabis in particular is a really dangerous drug that isn't unlike um, real cannabis in many ways. It's sold in vaporizers and as edibles. And despite common perceptions, cannabis use, especially synthetic cannabis use, isn't necessarily harmless. Increased access is associated with increased consumption. And the National Institute on Drug Abuse estimates that cannabis use is approximately as addictive and um, is prone to misuse as opioid use. About 8 to 12 percent of people using opioids become addicted, and 9 to 17 percent of people using cannabis become addicted. And the marketing of these products mirrors that of tobacco and that it focuses on flavors. So here's an image of the Delta 8 Boom Bestie bubblegum flavor, um, which is a Delta 8 product. Um, the River Dragonberry Delta Bang, which is an HHC product. And finally, the Delta 10 Girl Scout cookies vaporizing flavors. Um, these are all the kinds of products that are expected to appeal to youth that could be addressed with a flavor ban of all products, not just um, uh, traditional nicotine products. Um, we're continuing to do work on this issue. Um, our team is researching marketing by e-cigarette retailers that have been cited by the FDA and particularly interested in the new products that they transition to that are not nicotine based. Um, and we have a new proposal where we'll continue the research on this issue by conducting real-time surveillance of brick and mortar stores, online retailers, and social media promotions of these products. Um, and so that is all that I have to say. I think I can hand it off to Matt. Ryan, thanks so much, Dory. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks so much. I'm just really happy to join uh, Dory, Laura, and Jim tonight and glad to be here with all of you as well. This is really uh, what I'm going to present is really kind of what I call a wet spaghetti talk. I'm going to throw a lot of information out there and hopefully some of it sticks and resonates for you. I hope you see the relation of what I'll present to Laura's presentation on turbulence and changed regulations and specifically on one type of unintentional injury, specifically drug overdose and uh, more specifically opioid related deaths. And I hope you see the relation between public health policies and the material I'll present. When I heard this evening's theme was, why are people acting so weird, social disruption and substance use during the pandemic, I immediately thought this slide would be such a great place to start. Since the pandemic began until January 1st of this year, in San Francisco County, where I am, uh, there were 694 COVID deaths. There were almost twice as many deaths by drug overdose in San Francisco in 2020 and 2021 combined. And earlier this month, the CDC announced the 2021 figures for accidental drug overdose deaths, which is over 107,000 nationwide. And that's a 15% increase from the year before. Most of those are opioid related and specifically related to fentanyl, which is a synthetic opioid. Uh, uh, 71,000 of those 100. 7,000 deaths uh, related to fentanyl. And this has really been a trend for a long time. This chart uh, from the CDC shows the relation of the progression of heroin-related deaths, prescription opioid deaths, and synthetic opioid deaths. You can see that these syn synthetic opioid deaths really started taking off around 2014, even as heroin and prescription opioid deaths leveled off. Um, uh, and those synthetic opioid deaths have really just increased uh, in the years since. It's also worth mentioning that there's really a disproportionate impact of the opioid overdose epidemic. The rate of overdose deaths has been rising among Black individuals with a more than eight-fold increase in overdose death rates between 2014 and 2017. And national data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2019 shows there's reduced access to treatment for people of color compared to their white counterparts. 
There's some good news though. The FDA has approved three different medications for the successful treatment of opioid use disorder. That's what we call opioid addiction. Opioid use disorder, or OUD, is, is what you'll often see. I'm really going to focus on two of them today, methadone and buprenorphine, because they're controlled substances and because there's a lot of regulation and policy surrounding them, including a lot of changed regulation uh, in, in the wake of COVID. So if there's one thing I hope in this wet spaghetti talk that will stick, it's this. Methadone and buprenorphine are not simply replacing one drug for another. Absolutely not. We have decades and decades and decades of good scientific research that shows they are effective medical treatments. So there's decades of information. I just have a smattering in footnotes here of some of the evidence. Methadone reduces heroin use and reduces criminal activity. It decreases the need for health treatments. It decreases the need not just for drug-related hospitalization, but all-cause hospitalization. It reduces viral transmission of HIV and hepatitis. It reduces the risk of injection drug use illnesses, such as soft tissue infections, endocarditis, uh, bone infections, et cetera. Uh, maintenance use is associated with less drug use. And it reduces not just drug-related mortality, but all-cause mortality. And buprenorphine, very much the same. Uh, all of those same effects we find with methadone, we find with buprenorphine. And importantly, both of these really reduce human suffering. So both methadone and buprenorphine reduce opioid cravings. They reduce opioid use and they reduce opioid withdrawal. Further, when, they're at a, when they are appropriately dosed, they block the effects of other opioids in terms of creating a high, and buprenorphine has very good blockade for helping to prevent drug overdoses as well. So I'm gonna um, ask the question, why aren't there effective, uh, why aren't these effective medications preventing uh, the ever escalating drug overdose deaths. Well, you know what, they actually are, but only for the people who can access them. And policies uh, that, that create the environment for using these, two, these drugs for treating OUD simultaneously allow and prevent access to care. That's why I've put you know, restrictive policies in quotes here. Cue the restrictive policies. They are both permissive and they are restrictive at the same time. And I'm gonna introduce some of that. And we're gonna start by looking at the policy landscape for opioid treatment prior to COVID. I'm gonna bring us all the way back to 1914 when the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act was passed. And what the Harrison Act did was it said for all manufacturers, prescribers and distributors of, of narcotics drugs, they had a tax stamp and were taxed. It, it was an effort to regulate uh, narcotics drugs. And part of the Harrison Act said uh, that narcotics can only be used in good faith to treat medical problems. Well, fast forward uh, five years to a Supreme Court case, Webb versus the United States, where the Harrison Act was interpreted uh, and, and Webb v. the US said, in good faith does not include using narcotics drugs to treat narcotics addiction. So even though at the time there were many doctors and pharmacists prescribing opioids to treat opioid addiction, Webb v. the U.S. said that has to stop. There's no reason for that, and it's now illegal to use opioid drugs to treat opioid addiction. And the Harrison Act is still in effect, and Webb v. US is still in effect. The only reason that methadone and buprenorphine are allowed to treat opioid use disorder is because of the exceptions that policy creates to the Harrison Act. So from Webb v. US in 1919, all the way up until the early 1970s, there was no allowance for using narcotics drugs to treat narcotics addiction. So we have to look at uh, this series of three federal acts, uh, the Controlled uh, Substance Act, the Methadone Control Act, and the Narcotics Addiction uh, Treatment Act. And in California, uh, methadone uh, treatment is regulated by Title IX in the California Code of Regulations. What together these laws and policies do is they say, sure, methadone can be used to treat opioid addiction, but only in very specifically federally and state licensed clinics. 
Um, and there are very specific requirements. Uh, for instance, in-person dosing. So initially a patient on methadone has to show up to the clinic every day and only by showing up every day and having negative toxicology tests and toxicology tests are also required, can a person earn one take home at a time. So it takes weeks to months to earn one weekly take home for methadone in, in some places two weekly take homes. And it can take years to earn a month worth of take homes. You know, we're used to a month supply of medications for any other medication we take, but not for, for methadone. And uh, these acts also require uh, toxicology testing and counseling. The only other exception to the Harrison Act right now is buprenorphine. And so a series of acts in the 2000s allowed buprenorphine to be prescribed not just in specially licensed clinics, which it can be, um, uh, but also to or, or dispensed in specially licensed clinics, but also to, to be prescribed out of regular doctors or nurses offices, an advanced practice nurse, like a nurse practitioner or a clinical nurse specialist. Um, and the series of acts that, that allowed buprenorphine access for these purposes included the Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000, the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act of 2016, a final rule in 2016 created by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and finally in 2018, the Substance Use Disorder Prevention that Promotes Opioid Recovery and Treatment Act. What together did these acts sort of allow in terms of buprenorphine treatment? Well, they said, you know, people who have a DEA certificate can prescribe buprenorphine because it is a controlled substance, uh, a narcotic uh, in the older language, but they must possess a specific waiver. And how do people get that waiver? They have to apply through a specific governmental website. And uh, with an exception that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, they have to have very specific federally mandated education. Uh, in order to get the waiver, physicians have to have eight hours of federally mandated education. Physician assistants and advanced practice nurses have to have 24 hours of special education. And you have to prove you've had that special education when you apply for the DEA waiver to prescribe this medication. There are other aspects of restrictions around buprenorphine uh, prescription. There are some states, and we're very lucky in California, we don't have this, but some states limit the treatment duration for buprenorphine and the dose of buprenorphine that's allowed. Uh, similarly, payers, uh, uh, insurance uh, providers can limit the duration and dose of buprenorphine. Um, and then one thing that I'm particularly interested in as an advanced practice nurse is uh, the scope of practice. So physicians have independent practice every place in the country. Advanced practice nurses do not. Um, and in uh, uh, only about half the states do advanced practice nurses like nurse practitioners have independent practice. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about the result of those specific restrictions. But globally, you know, so these acts and these policies allow and restrict methadone and buprenorphine treatment. What are the outcomes of these restrictions? Well, for many, many years now, only one in four people who want medical treatment for opioid addiction can actually get it with methadone or buprenorphine. And part of that low treatment rate is due to a policy restricted workforce. As I said, about half the states restrict practice for nurses like NPs from practicing to the full extent of their education and certification. The most common restriction is a requirement for NPs and other nurses to have some sort of dependent or collaborative agreement or contract with physicians. But this specific restriction to nursing practice results in lower numbers of nurses with that waiver who could prescribe buprenorphine in office-based settings. And our UCSF research led by Joanne Spetz and other colleagues, which I've referenced on the slide here, and has been published in JAMA and the Journal of Nursing Regulation, uh, shows that in states with restrictive practices, there are lower rates of nurses with the waiver to prescribe buprenorphine. And the percentage of waived nurse practitioners is almost twice as high in states without restrictive practice as it is in states with restrictions. And I have here a map showing you green states are unrestricted and independent practice for advanced practice nurses like NPs. Yellow states have some restrictions and red states have 
pretty severe restrictions, although we are lucky in California, there were just some laws passed that have opened the door to easing those restrictions, but that easement has not yet been um, described or laid out. So let's talk about um, policy easements. Social disruption, as Laura was talking about, has occurred for everyone during the pandemic, including for people who use drugs and for people who participate in drug treatment, including treatment via methadone and buprenorphine. And to protect people and promote safety, um, uh, some of the in-person visit requirements and policies that allow methadone and buprenorphine were appropriately eased. So you remember the map I just showed you about the states with independent and restricted practice? The states with restricted practice during COVID had some easements in those restrictions. So during the pandemic, many of the states with nursing practice restrictions eased those restrictions, eased the requirements, and it'll be interesting to see, I think, of uh, the outcomes of those easements in, in many domains. But what were some of the easements with methadone? Well, first there was expanded methadone available by telehealth. So instead of just using HIPAA compliant telehealth platforms, uh, public platforms like uh, Skype and Zoom were allowed to do methadone visits. Medicare and Medicaid coverage for methadone expanded. So did many third party uh, payers for methadone treatments. And people really have to look to their specific states for the laws and regulations uh, about those. For existing patients on methadone, treatment can occur via telehealth and even telephone. But to start methadone, you still have to do an in-person visit. Some of the other changes for methadone that occurred during COVID included the greater allowance for take-home doses. So many, many people were allowed 14 days of take-home doses and 28 days of take-home doses. The whole purpose was just to minimize the exposure to COVID, to prevent people from standing in line next to a bunch of other people to line up for their, their methadone. Some of the other uh, changes uh, included some areas allow uh, uh, home delivery of methadone from the clinic, uh, either by designated staff or even official personnel uh, like law enforcement or um, National Guard or state uh, National Guard, um, as long as certain criteria are met. And in some places, there's been an easement of drug testing. So even though eight drug tests a year is still required for patients in official methadone clinics and treatment, uh, there is some easement to allow testing at a distance. Give your urine sample at home, uh, and, and that can get to the lab other than the ways it used to. Buprenorphine, some very similar easements. So the telehealth platforms were eased and greater allowance there, greater allowance for Medicare, Medicaid, and third-party payers. A difference with buprenorphine is both tele telehealth and telephone are okay. And in fact, patients can initiate buprenorphine, clinics can initiate buprenorphine with their wavered provider uh, via telephone or telehealth. They're, they, they're not required to come in person to initiate treatment. Another interesting piece about this uh, has to do with prescribing a controlled substance across state lines. So there had been some easement of providing telehealth in states in which providers are not registered with the DEA in order to promote access. But the question is this, have these easements resulted in success? It's kind of a mixed bag and it's gonna be interesting for us on a policy level to sort of see what happens. So the uh, first two numbers here talk about uh, some research findings about what's happened with the easements in terms of methadone. Uh, so the first reference from uh, JAMA Open Network uh, showing what the, the effects of easements in Canada and the United States during COVID uh, showed that even though the policies were eased, a lot of the methadone clinics weren't accepting new patients. Uh, and they also showed that in Canada, clinics offered more timely access than in the US. So that was really something uh, interesting. The second uh, study listed here uh, is specific to Spokane, Washington. And the quote is, despite a near doubling of take-home methadone doses during the COVID-19 exemption period, the increase in take-home doses was not associated with negative treatment outcomes or harms in the methadone adherent clients. So there's the good news. The next two numbers are really about buprenorphine treatment, uh, and both pertain to studies in Texas. Uh, uh, number three here it, uh, has to do with studying the 90 days after the emergency buprenorphine easements in March of, of 2020. And uh, the study found the rate of change of daily buprenorphine prescriptions and prescribers declined significantly 
during the COVID-19 period compared to the rates before COVID began. So not such great news there. The fourth study though shows in Texas also, the number of new patients on buprenorphine increased while the number of existing patients declined, but the number of prescribers didn't significantly change. There's another important change that happened during COVID, namely in April of last year, there was a change to the practice guidelines. Remember I said that physicians had to add eight hours of education and physician assistants and nurse practitioners and other advanced practice nurses, 24 hours of education. Well, the federal government said, if you limit your treatment to 30 patients, 30 patients on buprenorphine by your prescription, you no longer need the education, but you still need to apply for the DEA waiver and get the waiver. But has that changed the treatment landscape? Well, a study that Joanne Spetz led and that Laura and I uh, were involved in also showed um, that the growth in waivers uh, since April 2021 uh, for the 30 patient limit actually decreased. So waivers, you apply for a waiver according to a number of patients, 30 or 100 or 275. And these lines show since April 2021, there has been a dramatic decline in people requesting the 30 patient waiver, exactly that waiver uh, that you no longer need the education to get. So it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. What does the future look like? I think there's going to be a no waiver policy at some point, and there's legislation on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, that, that is moving right now. So they include the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, which would remove the X waiver requirement and hopefully increase access to buprenorphine. And there's also the Medication Access and Training Expansion, which would require healthcare providers to complete addiction-specific training before they can even get their DEA certificate of any kind in order to prescribe controlled substances. Both of these penned acts have advanced to committee as of this month, as of May 2022, and may be added to the Restoring Hope for Mental Health and Wellbeing Act, which is a legislative package aimed at addressing substance use treatment prevention and the workforce. And hopefully the legislative package will be voted on uh, by the House sometime in June. I'm going to bring us back to this slide that shows the number of COVID deaths related to drug overdose deaths in San Francisco, and finish with some policy suggestions. To improve access, we might remove the waiver altogether while also increasing provider education and pro empowering providers of all kinds to feel confident and comfortable prescribing buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. We want to long-term promote long-term treatment and end the restrictions on dose duration or uh, on dose amount or treatment duration. We want to utilize the full available workforce that exists right now and not restrict their practice. We want to promote, but we don't want to require counseling uh, for either methadone or buprenorphine because there is good evidence that says medication alone is sufficient for protecting lives and protecting health. And we definitely want to look at current policies to get to underserved and minoritized communities. So a final thought, I'm going to end with two quotes. One is from David Wilson, who's the dean of the public policy school at UC Berkeley. He says, public policy is what public officials within government and by extension citizens choose to do or not do about public problems. And I like this quote from Natalie Burke, who is uh, a health consultant, specifically when it comes to um, uh, equity uh, in healthcare. And she says, all policy is based on identity. So if we think about that, and we want to think about what our priorities are in society, and we want to protect people from opioid overdose deaths, which are ever increasing, we really want to think about how to change policies. At this point, I'm going to stop my share and uh, turn it over to Jim. Thanks very much. Um, I will keep my uh, presentation um, on the briefer side in the interest of taking any questions uh, that, that may come up. I'm reporting uh, tonight uh, on a uh, study that um, several of us at the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies did, in including uh, Laura and uh, Joanne Spetz, who was mentioned. Um, we did a, uh, well, a project called uh, RAPID, 
uh, which stands for Rapid Assessment of Pandemic Indirect Impact and Mitigating Interventions. Um, and this was work done with the California Surgeon General. As you can see here, of course, the COVID pandemic caused a great deal of disease and mortality from COVID itself. But in addition, there were very important indirect effects. The pandemic led to economic stressors such as unemployment and housing insecurity, psycho-emotional stressors such as fears of infection, stigma, loneliness, grief, and loss. Medical care was disrupted in, in some cases, or access to medical care. And uh, there were disruptions in, uh, as well in um, lifestyle. And, uh, and this was very disruptive. All of this contributed biologically through something called toxic stress response to a variety of health problems, risk factors and risk behaviors, such as hypertension and drinking, mental and behavioral health outcomes, such as depression, substance use and violence. You heard a little bit about that and physical health outcomes such as cardiovascular disease. We analyzed what we could find about the extent of these problems and what one could do to address them and what it would cost. And uh, I will walk you through that. Uh, we started by looking at what the indirect effects of COVID-19 uh, were. Um, this was research that we did fairly early in the pandemic in August um, or through August 2020, and with some follow-up reviews in early 2021. We prioritized several conditions, which I'll, I'll come back to, and looked at what we called mitigating strategies, that is interventions to reduce the severity of these problems. We collected cost data, and then we did something called cost effectiveness analysis, which I will show you. Um, using something called the BRACE model, which we developed. You can see here the mix of types of problems we found. This big blue pie slice is mental health problems. Uh, stroke it had um, a, a similar number of, these are numbers of studies. The stroke had a similar number of studies, heart disease. Intimate partner violence is this one here that's sort of a, a yellow. Uh, the blue one is, um, social determinant issues, substance abuse, um, and um, so on. And what we found is there was uh, evidence for substantial human and economic costs for six health conditions during the pandemic. Again, aside from COVID disease itself, adult depression, homelessness, opioid use disorder, interpersonal violence, excessive alcohol use, and increased stroke mortality. These health harm, harms resulted in large part from uh, ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, both in the offspring of adults today and in adults with a past history of childhood adversity. They are, there are mitigation strategies to address these and that's what we looked at. Here are some of what we found. The increased indirect health harms due to COVID are shown in this column. So depressive symptoms increased by 37%. That's what this means. 1.37 means uh, more than one third increase. Intimate partner violence by the study we found increased by about 11%. Homelessness increased more than sixfold excessive alcohol use, 19%, opioid use disorder, which you just heard about, about an increase of about 63%, and stroke mortality, an increase of about 50%. This led to what we call quality-adjusted life years. Those are healthy years of life being lost. And the numbers are, are pretty big. These are estimates per million population, because California has... Um, uh, more than 30 million um, people, close to 40 million, and many of them are indeed adults, most of them. Uh, depressive symptoms resulted in an estimated 69,000 healthy years of life or qualities lost um, per million population, and an additional 10,000 in their children. So that's the 
the biggest uh, um, estimate of, of health burden of the things we looked at, but intimate partner violence is also high, 52,000 and so on. You can see uh, lots of lost health. And if we look at the societal costs due to medical care, due to other kinds of costs, the numbers are, are staggering. Um, we estimated that depression uh, induced costs of about $2 billion per million population. So again, if you multiply that by the number of adults in the state, it gets to be a, a really big number. Um, also a big cost is for homelessness and uh, excessive alcohol uh, abuse, uh, also more than a billion. So these are our big costs. And the question is, what can we do about it? So here we have some possible interventions. For depression, we have um, a, a cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and antidepressant medications. Estimated cost about $878 per case. That sounds like a, a, a large amount of money. Um, would result in gains per million population of about 14,000 qualies um, that for a total cost of about 44 and a half million. But here's the thing, by treating depression, and as you'll see for other conditions as well, we're avoiding a lot of costs, keeping people healthier. So in the end, treating depression is cheaper and better than not treating it. And this is a finding that we pretty much across the board, all of these interventions within 10 years are both increasing healthy years of life, that is increasing qualities, and also saving money. It's uh, what we like to see in, in my field is something uh, that we can do that is both good for health and economically affordable. Here we see a little bit more detail on the timing. And it turns out that some interventions save money very quickly. CBT and antidepressant, antidepressants would probably save money within the first year. Um, some of the other interventions, such as a nurse family partnership for intimate partner violence is an expensive intervention and it doesn't save money initially, but it certainly uh, provides a lot of health benefits. And within three years, it's starting to save money see 5.3 million in savings, and over 10 years, 60 million in savings. You'll notice that over the 10-year perspective, all but one of these interventions is saving money while bringing a lot of health benefits. So this is kind of a menu, or you could say a roadmap for interventions that the state of California could choose to support, to uh, pay for treatment of depression, um, set up uh, and, and, and uh, fund nurse family partnership programs, provide rent subsidies, and so on. Finally, we will end with a pretty picture. This is a, a technique uh, in, in this kind of work to show the uncertainty in our estimates. There's always some uncertainty. And uh, what it shows uh, along the bottom is the net savings. So anything to the right of this zero here means net savings. You can see almost everything here is in the net savings area. And of course, qualities gained or healthy years of life gained all above zero. So what it shows is even though with this kind of analysis, we have uh, some uncertainty in the data, still for all of the plausible values we're talking about, saving a lot of money and saving a lot of health. And I will stop there. Uh, in the interests of um, allowing questions, if there are any. Thank you. Thanks so much to you all for a um, really interesting set of talks. And I have a few questions. Starting with you, Dory, you know, my first question is, you know, you, you talked a lot about how easy it is for um, kids to use e-cigarettes and get them. Um, and that it can even be a situation where you can't really tell if people are using these products indoors. So how can parents and teachers 
figure out if kids are developing an early addiction to uh, to nicotine and and um, how 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 can people kind of navigate this new world where um, tobacco products are now in this pretty easily concealed form? Yeah, I think there's two questions there. One is how do you know, and the other is how do you deal with it. Um, and uh, I think the how do you deal with it question is one of these sort of long term questions. It's like any substance use. Um, how do you deal with it means like sort of stepping back from you shouldn't do that and you know I know better um, to have conversations that are less judgmental. Um, how do you know I think is a, is kind of an easier question in some ways, um, particularly because like the flavor the products that are commonly used by young people um, smell like fruity flavors oh. um, and so <laughs> if you smell those in the room. Um, it's not like air freshener, it's a vaping device. <laughs> um, and it's the same at schools. Um, you know, as, as a substance use researcher, I, I have a lot of conversations with my kids about um, cannabis use and tobacco use. And, you know, they ask me like, which one's safer and which one's less safe. And I try to be forthright about sort of my understanding of these issues. Um, and as a result, they do things like, you know, tell me, a, how many people are smoking in the bathrooms at school or vaping in the bathrooms at school and and hand me like horrible ads the one that i remember was a, an ad to get cannabis delivered that they got in their fortune cookies um because they know like how excited i am to see all of these things and so um, i think when you have that kind of relationship it's an easier to deal with it um, because you know it's a conversation rather than a stop that um yeah super helpful and also i think being able being aware of like that what products look like now that they don't look like cigarettes um that they look like right. jewelry thank you dory and matt um my first question for you is you know i i loved your final slide where you were um asking about you know you had those quotes and and there was one about all politics or about identities and and i i I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to who these days, especially um, in California, is um, developing opioid um, use disorder and, and is vulnerable to um, uh, an overdose. Because I think we have a, all have carry around in our, our minds a lot of stereotypes about the kinds of people who um, experience these um, um disorders and and what's the what's the data tell you boy there there's a a lot of answers to that question just to to sort of keep it short um you know anybody who's introduced to opioids is at risk and then we know that uh, that particular populations are at higher risk uh we know if there is a history of other addiction or a family history of addiction, there's higher risk for developing an opioid use disorder. We know that longer term opiate use um, or higher dose opiate use, even for therapeutic purposes, puts people at risk. We also know that young people are particularly vulnerable to developing addictive disorders. You know, the young brain is a learning machine. And the more it's introduced to drugs and the higher the doses of the drugs, the young brain is gonna learn addiction. Mm. So those are some of the most important answers. And I think, you know, just to sort of speak to what Dory was talking about, you know, ki kids who are so vulnerable, um, we know in terms of drug policy that policies that are sticks rather than carrots don't work so great. So we really need to engage young people because they are interested in, in these topics. And, uh, you know, their, their minds are sort of like, they're the, they're the future chemists and the junior chemists who are interested in how cannabis and how opioids work. So we need to engage with them about those, those things, including the risks. That's a wonderful, thank you, Matt. And then finally, Jim, um, so the, you were showing some really big numbers there um, in terms of the um, costs of doing nothing about these sec indirect effects of the pandemic, um, the costs if we act. And I do know that the, bu the budget coming out of the state of California um, has a lot of, of the um, agenda items that you shared with us in it. Um, particularly around homelessness and behavioral health services 
and um, children experiencing adverse childhood events and so forth. Um, but my question of you um, is kind of a big one, which has to do with the fact that it's that we often, you know, if public health is really working the way it, it, we hope it will, it's sort of invisible and it, it's preventing people from becoming sick or if they do become sick from getting really sick and suffering and, and dying from, from um, these health harms. And, um, but it's, it, it strikes me as very challenging to figure out if you actually were able to save lives and to avert um, uh, healthy life years lost. And so is, is there a way going forward that these investments that the state of California is making to protect our population from these secondary effects of the, of the pandemic, most notably substance use um, um, related outcomes, is there a way to know um, that we've done a good job and that we've saved lives uh, and prevented illnesses but, or, or arrested the um, progression of illnesses for people coming out of this horrible pandemic? Well, if, you know, if the scale of intervention is large enough, um, and if you, so you, if you do enough of these um, counseling programs, medications, et cetera, um, you should uh, be able to detect a change in uh, the uh, causes of death and, um, and uh, potentially uh, diagnoses in various um, medical databases. Now I am, as you know, Laura, I am uh, not uh, focused on those empirical measurements, but I have colleagues, particularly econometricians and health services researchers, um, including um, our uh, institute's director, Joanne Spetz, who are masterful um, at that kind of analysis. I believe you've done quite a few of that kind of thing. And I think with uh, those kinds of methods, you look for changes in the trends. Um, discontinuities is a technical term. You know, something's been trending up and then uh, a big intervention program happens and then it flattens out or trends down, that's a really good sign. Uh, but you're absolutely right. We don't always have those uh, uh, kinds of definitive evidence. And so uh, oftentimes what we do is rely on data from very carefully designed clinical trials. And then we assume that if the intervention shown to be effective in the clinical trials is increased, that we will see similar kinds of benefits in the population. Um, it's a little bit of a leap of faith, but it is a leap of faith I am willing to make um, because um, uh, there, there, is, uh, you know, there is evidence from the clinical trials. One last thing, and sometimes there's evidence from other countries, and I'm sure Matt could speak to this, and what's the evidence for different policies regarding uh, treatment of opioid abuse um, in other countries. And uh, I think what we, we can learn from other countries, we don't like to learn from other countries here in the United States. Uh, there's this an American exceptionalism with it, which is generally uh, silly and a bad idea. Uh, but sometimes uh, we will look at and see, oh, you know, Norway is handling that well. Portugal uh, has a really good policy about uh, drug addiction. So those are some thoughts. So it's even possible to measure something that didn't happen and the fact that it didn't happen. Absolutely. And that's pretty cool. And we should probably do more of that. And let's hope that we pre prevented a lot of life years lost as um, a result of these uh, challenging outcomes of the pandemic. So thank you all for um, tuning in tonight. And uh, thank you panelists. It was really um, informative. And let's all go forward um, doing our best to recover from this pandemic and its effects. Thank you. Thank Good night. you.